of TOV, um, who is running this year as well. So I'll introduce myself. <laughs> uh, my name is Will Russell. I'm a teacher uh, here at the New York State Public Schools. I'm a member of more than uh, Movement and Rank and File Educator, um, as well as Gia and formerly Bright, uh, with a Social Justice Office of the, of the United Federation of Teachers here in the city. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and start with Brian. Uh, he'll speak, and then we'll have Gia speak for a time, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, it's really nice to be here with you. I look forward to your comments and the discussion. I tried to write down what I'm going to say, but I think it's going to be a little bit more free-form than normal. Yes. More closer to the mic. Yes. Is that better? Okay. So I'll speak directly to the microphone. And yes, I am Brian Jones. Many of you uh, might not be sure because the last time you saw me, I had a whole lot more hair back in 2014. Oh, what four years will do to you. Um, and uh, since that time also, uh, now my daughter has started public school. She's in third grade in the public school here in New York City. Uh, my son is not yet of uh, school age. But on my way over here, I was thinking, you know, like, what do I want for my kids out of this public school thing? Like, what is it that I want for them? And so I thought I'd start with that and just articulate that to you. Um, because that, to me, is, is what we're fighting for. And on the one hand, there's, of course, and I think we have to state, a way in which the schools serve a function to help, ooh, just got quiet, to help children or make it possible for them. It is an essential service, something that you, have, not only is it mandatory and is it compulsory, but even if it weren't compulsory in our present society, you, it is structured in a way that you have to get that paper. You have to make your way through those educational hoops in order to have options when you become an adult. So what do I want for my daughter? Of course, I want her to be able to navigate the world as it is presently constituted, um, you know, be gainfully employed and be able to move out of that. So that's my aspiration. Um, but there's something else, isn't there? Because if she just does that, then it's like, well, meanwhile, by the time she's an adult, like, I'm not sure if the air will be breathable or the water will be drinkable. I don't know if the, you know, the plastic that is currently, the, that's in the ocean, that's the size of Texas, will be the size of the African continent by then. I don't know if fish will be edible. Like, there is, if we are just training our children to kind of make it in the world as, as it presently is, then I think we're failing them, ultimately. So there has to be something else. And to me, that something else is Presenting the world to them, and some people call this critical thinking, but I feel like that phrase is kind of, it means many things to many people, so let me say it a different way. It's showing, showing them that the world was made by people. That it is not that the present order is just or ordained by a deity, but it was made, and therefore it can be unmade. And it seems seamless and eternal, but we can show them the seams. We can show them how it was put together, and how it was fashioned by human beings so that they can figure out how to make it or remake it a different way. You know, there's the first thing, the kind of jumping through the hoops, I think you could call schooling. The second thing, which may require tearing down said hoops, you could call education, real learning. And presently, our society prioritizes the schooling over the education. And I think that's what has happened to our system from pre-K all the way up through post-secondary uh, and graduate school and beyond. There is a rationing that Gia is gonna talk about, uh, the privatization of education here in New York City. There is a rationing and a tightening of resources such that people are desperate to make, just to make it through the hoops and then desperate to get into college, into complete college, desperate just to make it through the hoops so that they can have some opportunity. There's a, a book that came out uh, about two years ago about the way in which people in many of the deindustrialized, um, you know, Midwestern towns, Appalachian towns, places where 
the industries that sustained these whole communities have just gone away. And, what, and one of the things that has swooped in is for-profit online colleges, people who are desperate to get some kind of credential so that they can get a leg up in the world, um, and then that, that desperation is exploited. And now, of course, people who do all of the hoop jumping play by all the rules, keep their heads down. They don't go to protest, they just, you know, they just work a million jobs and do whatever they have to do to pay for college and keep their head down and make it all the way through tend to make it all the way through saddled with enormous debts, which then further constrains their uh, choices and opportunities when they graduate. So I feel like we're fighting for something. We're fighting to bring the education back into the school system, and that requires a massive redistribution of resources. It requires space and time and salaries and free periods and resources and science laboratories and libraries, and librarians in the libraries, and art teachers, and music teachers, and then specialized music teachers who teach instruments, and then other ones who teach voice, and other librarians who specialize. You know, it requires a lot of things. Um, and usually you can find all of those things and more in the schools of the wealthy. Usually they have at least two or three of each of those things um, in the schools that they provide for their children, and of course they always have small class sizes. I want to say something, maybe this is, how am I doing? Okay. Um, maybe I'll just say one more, one or two more things, um, which is about the way that the kind of education politics landscape has changed as I see it. Um, when many of us in this room who started embarking on these battles, and certainly the last time when I was running for office and was involved in uh, the, the movement of rank-and-file educators, part of the United Caucuses of rank-and-file educators who reform teacher education caucuses all around the country. Um, we got started in that work in the Obama era. We got started under a liberal democratic administration who favored, which favored privatization, which favored charter schools, which favored school closings, which favored firing of teachers and celebrating the firing of teachers en masse. So actually all of that gained incredible force and strength under that administration and it had a patina, it had a veil, it, had a, uh, it was shielded by an aura of justice, including racial justice, that this was, all of this was being done to save black students in particular, always highlighted at the front of these efforts. Um, and they, these people would wrap themselves in the robes of, civil, of the civil rights movement. The most egregious example is, um, was in the New York Times business section where a Goldman Sachs banker was at a fancy um, casino style fundraiser event for a charter school chain. And the New York Times reporter covering this event quoted this banker as saying that he was the new civil rights movement. That's what he said. So, but I don't think that people necessarily see it that way anymore. First of all, time has passed, and the schools have done their thing, and so many of their promises have fallen short, and it's, it's less, um, it has less of a veil of, of justice uh, and progress surrounding it. And now, certainly, even less so, dramatically less so, that now it is the policy of the Trump administration, of the Betsy DeVos administration, that these people have gone even farther in, the, in favor of the idea of choice and the idea of ripping up the public school system uh, and the Department of Education and dismantling uh, all of that in favor of, uh, of a free market way of organizing schools as, um, as things that shoppers choose on a market. And as we've said before, and it might bear saying again, some people will experience these changes as an improvement. And of course, that's the case. Some people were at an underserved public school and were offered some kind of privatized or semi-privatized alternative, and it was better for them. So of course, that's an experience that some people had. And some people had the opposite, in that, in that they came from the semi-privatized alternative. It wasn't working out for them. They were pushed out or counseled out or 
they were they had needs that the school couldn't meet, and they went back to the public school system and had a better experience. That too is a valid experience, although of course we understand that that experience was less reported on. But now the veil of justice and progress has been ripped away uh, for many people now that it's uh, these people in charge. And even deeper still, as a colleague of mine once said, it's almost like Trump has ripped up the floorboards of our society and is showing everybody the rotten foundation underneath. And it's like, it's harder for liberals to just say, well, that wasn't really racist, you know, so-and-so didn't really mean that remark, or whatever excuses kind of always came up to say that racism didn't go that deep or wasn't that big a problem. Now it's clear it's a huge problem. Now it's clear that it's a deep problem. Now it's clear that it's connected to the whole of American history, and that actually if it's not confronted and examined and dealt with, then we're failing in some way, because look at what has happened and look at what is now possible. To their credit, the union activists, mostly I think we could say in kind of blue states where there is strongholds such as they are of trade unionism in this country, in those places, these teacher reform caucuses have seized on the idea that racism is essential to understanding what's been going on in the schools and to what needs to be fixed. And they've created initiatives like the Black Lives Matter School Week um, which this year is going to be the first week of February, FYI. Um, and during that week, it's a kind of do-it-yourself activism at greater or lesser scales, and the demands are hire more black teachers, um, end um, zero tolerance of punitive policies, and teach black history. And so it's an opportunity for activists to both make demands and push for environmental changes, uh, little e environmental changes, in their schools. At the same time, in a very different environment, where we don't, generally speaking, see large populations of black students, um, or people who are heavily unionized in closed shop uh, bargaining units, this in the so-called, and I say so-called because you can't paint everybody with the same brush, red state uh, revolts, we've seen an incredible and inspiring strike wave. And it seems to me that these two dynamics, a dynamic, on the one hand, fueled by austerity, the rationing of resources, the tightening of belts, um, the cutting, drastic cutting of budgets and opportunities, combined with the degradation of teachers' labor, and we have to say overwhelmingly female labor, of the work and value in what teachers do, the sense of their professionalism and judgment, all of that being ground down, not just in places like New York City, but in places like West Virginia, um, has led to this incredible and inspiring explosion uh, of struggle, um, albeit struggle that hasn't yet highlighted or thought of or necessarily put at the front um, the kind of anti-racist demands that are being um, foregrounded elsewhere. And so I think we have a job to do, speaking of socialists uh, in this movement and in this moment, in bringing these uh, forces and dynamics together. The, eruption of class anger at the oppressive conditions of public education in so many places, the austerity and rationing, which leads to a focusing on schooling and leaves little room for genuine education, and the deeply racist dynamics um, in places like New York City, in places like Arizona, too, and Los Angeles, and Washington State, and many other places uh, we could name. Um, where we see tremendous disparities in who gets what resources, in who has what, in who gets through which hoops, um, and everything about the schools is shaped uh, by racism. And so the activists rightly um, highlight that. I think if we bring these dynamics together, we could have a very powerful movement for educational change. And I think our socialist solutions, to the extent that we can present them, um, should in the first instance be rooted in these real developments that are already going on and that are present in the world. Um, and they show tremendous possibilities for transforming our schools and making more space and time and opportunity and resources for genuine teaching and learning, for real education and less hoop jumping and schooling.
never got to retire and you came out. Thank you so much. Please give yourselves a hand. Um, thank you to members of the Green Party, uh, socialist groups, um, ISO, and everyone for putting this event together, for bringing out all the stuff to live stream, um, signs, everything. I am an you know, 18-year special education teacher in New York City. Uh, I've taught K to 12, and I can't tell you, you know, like every year I think, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm getting better at this thing, and I'm, it's October, and I'm, on, oh, my eyes are turning in the back, but um, <laughs> in the back of my head, and I have a 15-year-old who just turned 15 yesterday, who's come up through the New York City public school system. And I'm just amazed. Any New York City public school teachers here today in the room, please raise your hand. Woo! <laughs> um, parents in the room, students, supporters, come here. Yay! <laughs> um, I want to start off by just t telling you a little bit of a story. And I know some people may have heard this, but I love to brag. Um, I teach at the Earth School in the East Village. And I came up through a really traditional public school system myself. Um, I was being schooled, I wasn't really educated, and it wasn't until uh, I came to the school that I realized what could be, what was possible. And then after that, I found Brian Jones and people from ISO and from more who opened my eyes to other possibilities. So my awakening didn't happen until more recently, maybe eight years ago. So I have to start by saying I stand on the shoulder of giants, um, especially with you all in the room, that at this school where we get to teach students, not to the test, but to the, to the children, um, I teach fourth and fifth grade, we get to write our own curriculum. And this is the year that we're, we got to create a curriculum that we call Justice for All question mark, right? And we're starting eight to 10 year olds. Um, we start off the year by asking ourselves, so who's responsible for making sure people have rights? Where does justice come from? And can one person make a difference? These are questions we ask throughout the year. And at the beginning, the, or one of our first units is, is a study of the origins of the U.S. through three different perspectives. Through the perspective of the indigenous people who are living here, the Africans who were brought over and enslaved, and we use that language, um, and the European colonists. And there's a period, and I know Brian and a few others have heard this, but people have asked me to keep repeating this, that this is possible in a public elementary school. Um, we do, and this is from straight out of Rethinking Schools, um, if you've never heard of it as a resource, please tap into it. We uh, do an entire study on rethinking Columbus, right? And it's tough. next Monday is supposedly Columbus Day, right? We call Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, kids put Columbus on trial. And <laughs> they go on trial. And throughout that whole process, they're learning about the Taino. They're learning about Columbus himself. They're learning about the King and Queen of Spain. They're learning about uh, every single, like even the, the people who were on the ships, right? To what degree are these people guilty of the atrocities that happened to the indigenous people? And always, by the end of it, the kids recognize and they hold the system of empire the most responsible for the, for the atrocities that occurred to the people, the exploitation of people. And these are eight to 10 year olds, like 80% guilty. King, Queen, Fernand, 10%. Columbus, 5%. And everybody else, the other 5%. And it amazes me that they understand systems of power at that age. And, and then I look around, you know, I'm walking down the streets and I'm like, we're all just We've all just been educated uh, enough. We've all been schooled, literally, right? And so in New York State, Brian kind of talked like broadly, but really focusing in on New York, we are the most segregated school system in the entire nation. And New York City is even worse. 
right? But our entire government keeps touting about how much they spend per pupil. It's the highest. On average, if you look at just the numbers, it's the highest average of, in the nation, right? So the red states are, what are you complaining about? We only spend this much per kid, and you guys spend double that or triple that. But if you look down on how the money is spent and where the money is actually going, sure, the more affluent districts, right? School, school zones based on um, segregation that from Jim Crow time, um, of course they get more money. Redlining, they get more money. But in New York City, that number is a lot smaller. In fact, in New York City, one of the biggest chunks of the budget doesn't go towards students, it goes towards special education lawsuits. Because we can't seem to provide the services, and so most of the money actually doesn't even go to the schools. It's going to pay for special education students to get services at private schools. It's a huge industry. There are lawyers you'll find that, that know about this. So and actually just tap into that work. Um, I'll just give you some numbers. In Buffalo, there are 31,000 students. In Syracuse, about 20,000. Rochester, 26,000. These are the big five, okay? New York City, 1.1 million students. And we're the most segregated. Then, one day, I'm, I'm reading the Fiscal Policy Institute because I'm wondering, like, there's got to be a route. There, I need to uncover this thing. And I find out that New York State actually leads the nation in income disparity. The top 1% in Manhattan makes 114 times more than the bottom 99% in just Manhattan. And Rochester is number two. And if you dig a little further, you find that some people theorize that all the societal ills, such as uh, mass incarceration, um, you know, mental health issues, uh, teenage pregnancies, poor performance in schools, even homelessness, or you know, like due to poverty or high rates of poverty. But there was the most extensive study done called the Spirit Level. If you've never heard of it, please look it up. And the Spirit Level is, you know, that level that you use to hang pictures. It's not a religious thing. It's um, <laughs> although I like to think that there's some spirituality, but um, in the in nature. Um, that there's this equilibrium, like what makes societies more equal, right? And this is what led me to my understanding, a greater understanding about the importance of socialism, okay? Because all of these societal ills, mental health issues, violence, incarceration, are not like, oh, if you live in poverty, you're more likely to get, you know, into these situations, no. It's the, if you look at a society, it's the greater the income gap, the greater the, the disparity between rich and poor leads to greater likelihood of these societal ills. And so if New York State leads the nation in this income gap, in this disparity, where is our answer? Where, does the answers lie? where do the answers lie? In closing that gap, right? But if you're holding the ability for our teachers, for our systems of education to maintain this gap, to maintain as a, as a gatekeeper for certain kids, for future generations to have access to the kinds of education for critical thinking, for collective problem solving, you're keeping that from people and you're letting that go to the wayside, then we're, we're definitely helping to ensure that this gap continues, that the rich and the elite will always have this kind of education and the poor will always get this kind of schooling like Brian was talking about. And this is why we have to talk at a policy level, not just about what policies are in place, because Governor Cuomo and all, the, all of our elected officials, Democrat, Republicans, talk about policies, but it, excuse my French, I'm gonna say it's bullshit, number one. The answer is why in the communities. We know, right, and we can say what we want for our kids, what we want for our society in terms of education. We want our kids to be able to think crit critically, not just to be able to fill in test bubbles and things like that. I thought I start by protesting high stakes standardized testing, right? I boycotted the test for my kids. I organized opt out. I became a conscientious objector. I refused to administer the state test, even though my union told me don't do it as a job action. You could get fired. I still did it, and look. Still here. Imagine if we all, if we 
all took a stand like that. So yeah, I'm writing for office. I'm writing for office, but really, this is really for us. This is like our opportunity to be able to talk to other people we don't know, to be able to build our ideas together and build a movement. Because that's the part that's really missing in this. Because no policy is going to change shit, right? We can only do that at the local level. We can we can be the only ones who like if you're a teacher. Say I'm not doing this. I'm on the principle of do no harm. Do no harm. I will not be forced to comply with something that I don't believe in and I know is going to actually harm children and harm society in the long run. And if we all maintain that kind of principle, imagine the kind of change that we could create. The power actually lies in here. And if we also, the second part is not just right, not just looking at the individual policies, but looking at the system that we work in. We have to question the system. We have to question the process. This entire electoral process is bullshit. We have a two-party system that's saying, these are your two choices, and so make a deal with the devil. And what happens after that? <laughs> we get people elected in local office to go to Albany, and then what happens? They're in a room, they're isolated, what change can really come? The real change has to happen on the streets and in the schools and in our communities. So I'm talking about taking that pyramid and inverting it, right? We have to invert this power structure. We have to invert this entire system. And how that happens has to be developed through our conversations. So I'm really not interested in talking a lot. I really want to hear from you guys. I'd rather just form like this giant circle, <laughs> really. But the questions are really about how are we going to change the system so we turn this table into more of a, a powwow, so to speak, and develop the answers together so we're not just talking at each other but with each other and developing the answers. And so with that, I'm going to close. I'm gonna, I would love to hear from people in the room and actually have a conversation. Start. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so people can hear me, I think, right? Uh, so before we get into the conversation, we're going to make a little bit of space for announcements. So we're going to take one from I think, Nikki and then one from Gloria. Uh, yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Nikki from the Downtown Branch of the International Socialist Organization. We're co sponsoring this event with the Green Party. I know you guys got a sign up sheet, so you can another one for us. Um, we have uh, two events on it. We have our Where We Stand series, which is a packet that goes through our politics. If you're interested in learning more about our politics, obviously, we also have the field back there um, after the discussion's over. And we also have our, we're doing a clinic defense this Saturday um, outside of the Margaret Sanger Center. Um, that's downtown. Um, we go there the first of every Saturday to counter protest the anti choice crowd with another group called NYC for Abortion Rights. So if you're interested, that's going to be Saturday morning. All the details are on here. And you can, of course, uh, talk to me or at the IOC people after if you have any more questions. Oh, yeah, I'm just saying, yeah, sorry, that way. Yeah, and I'll um, contest with it. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Gloria Matera, uh, co chair of the Green Party of New York. And so, uh, yes, this is it's kind of a second of our series, and I'll put this back mm -hmm. there. There are several other series. On health care, um, on segregation, on housing that we partnered with um, the ISO and several other groups, so one for that. Uh, so we really think that the Howie Hawkins uh, GLE campaign is really an important campaign. It is a Green Party campaign um, with our ballot line, but as also like me, Gia and Howie are socialists, eco socialists, and so we think that this is a good opportunity once again to have an independent campaign statewide, uh, you know Cuomo's going to be on the ballot and that's, we want to really send a resounding no uh, that progressives are not going to support someone like that. And so if you could sign up, there's sign up sheets going around, uh, but there's also in the back a volunteer <coughs> form. We'd really love people to get involved in any way they can, whether it's phone banking, social media, going out on the street, giving out flyers, uh, any kind of help we would appreciate. And um, you want to 
And we are going to pass the um, donation bucket for defraying the expenses for renting rooms and, and organizing the, the series of meetings. So thank you. All right, everybody. So we're going to go ahead and, or, and open up the discussion. I see a lot of uh, teachers and, and parents and uh, other people who are lives are connected to education in some way. So I'm sure we'll have, and schooling. So I'm sure we'll have a really lively discussion. Uh, the way we're going to do it, I will keep a stack. That means that if you want to get on the stack to speak, just try to raise your hand. I'm going to call on you by an article of clothing. The stack is not open by yet. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll write down your, your, your something I can recognize you by. I'll call you and I'll give you three minutes to speak and I'll tap when you're at 30 seconds. So the reason we do that is just to make sure that we have an equitable space where everybody can speak. Um, and I, I will think I can progress the stack, which means if I see it skewing more towards nail or something, I, I might call on people out of order. But I, I'll try to get to everybody. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and take it. I'll just get hands right now. And Yeah, just project. Um, all right, so I'm Ryan. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, how do students play into the uh, the fight for uh, bringing a better education system into our schools? Uh, next, I have Aisa, and then I have just you over here, here after Aisa. Uh, regarding this concept of schooling versus education, I wonder if you could reflect on the impact of standardized testing and the changes that have recently been made in the global history regents exam and what's happened and I've witnessed in at least two schools and I've heard of um, anecdotally several schools where in order to get them to pass they are taking away global from the ninth grade giving a double period of global in the tenth grade cutting off the entire curriculum of global one and two meaning anybody that you know remotely looks at the children in front of us their history is no longer taught and they're starting to teach global history, starting with absolutism, and they completely changed global history into a Eurocentric um, curriculum based on the test. And this whole concept of schooling versus getting kids to be empowered, um, and the influence of changes being made policy-wide from the state that end up impacting the schools and making the education less equitable. Great. So I have the, the person over here, and then I have, I have the person in the blue shirt here. <coughs> This, I guess, myself, just, uh, oh, my, my name is uh, Tom Syracuse. Um, I'm, I've been active in the Green Party for many years. I was a, um, a high school, public high school teacher at George Washington High School in Enwood for 29 years. I've also taught at the uh, at Bostos Community College. Uh, at the Manhattan, what is that? The one over here at uh, the Manhattan Community College. Uh, hmm? I forgot now the name of it. I don't know if there. I was only there for a few months. Anyway, uh, I'm just. Uh, uh, is there uh, how many people here do not belong to either the Green Party, the Socialist Party? or the ISO? Three, four. So that's, that's a big challenge for us. Uh, that we have to, and it's not easy. I, I'm, I'm not taking this lightly. Uh, we have to get beyond the choir, preaching to the choir. Um, now, I think that I, 
came to the conclusion at the end of my teaching career that real education depends mostly on the individual teacher in the classroom. Uh, we, we cannot expect the, uh, the, the uh, school system, the bureaucracy, uh, the people that run the school system uh, to set up a system in the interest of uh, the, the students that go to uh, public schools. Uh, and of course, uh, this is nothing new. The uh, public schools in this country and probably in, in, in every country uh, are set up to serve the interest of the uh, ruling class of that country. And so I believe that you really cannot have any real education in a capitalist country. So what is to be done? It's up to the individual teacher in the classroom to be able to take a risk and to get beyond the prescribed curriculum and the textbooks, etc. I know that my own education really uh, did not uh, begin when uh, I was in high school. Yes, I learned the uh, basics, uh, the three R's, but as far as real education, understanding the system, uh, that, that did not begin in high school. It didn't begin when I went to college, I, and it didn't begin when I got my master's degree either. It began on my own. I had to educate myself. And that's what I think that those of us who are teachers or who have children in public schools, uh, we have to educate ourselves. And we have to then be willing to, uh, if we're teachers, as I said, to be in the classroom and to impart our understanding to the students, even though that may take a risk. And if we're parents, get involved with the Parent Teacher, uh, Teachers Association. And there's one short, one, one short thing. I think that uh, one of the great um, threats to public education is privatization. And that means charter schools. And I'm a little concerned that so far I do not see the words charter schools on any of our literature. When we talk about uh, uh, private, uh, privatization of charter schools, we have to, I mean, a uh, uh, public education, we have to mention those words, charter schools. We have to end charter schools. Well, just to respond to a few things, I mean, I think we face a real question, which is, are the schools worth fighting for or not? Are they just an instrument to oppress us? And if so, then forget, it. let them have the schools, and what's the fuss? Like, why do we fight over curriculum or class size or any resources or any of it? So I think there's, we just have to recognize that they are neither the thing that is going to free us, ultimately, nor are they something to give over or just give up on. I think they're worth fighting for. And I, I, it might be that, ironically, it's in the fighting over the schools that we get the best education possible. Like, the struggle to change our schools might teach us more than any class can teach us. And often that has been the pattern, that it's when we become aroused and we straighten up our backs and decide that things have to change in the place where we spend and our children spend so much time. That's when we really start learning about things. And I'll just say one small example, which is my daughter, just to bring it back to her. Eight years old, third grade. She is in a school where they learn about Ella Baker from the Civil Rights Movement. And like, I didn't learn about Ella Baker until I was in my 20s. I'm really excited that my daughter gets to learn about Ella Baker. On the other side, my daughter is also determined not to get in trouble ever under any circumstances. 
And she has not quite yet put together that Ella Baker was somebody who got in trouble under a lot of circumstances. So she's kind of going through the world, really careful not to get in trouble in school while learning about troublemakers like Ella Baker. So, okay, so something is not yet connected for her, fine. But I don't want her in a school where there's a Eurocentric curriculum, where the black freedom struggle is never discussed or never on the table. I'd rather have those things introduced. I'd rather have the seeds planted. I'd rather have the room for her to, to explore, go in that direction, and eventually make those connections and decide to, to fight for the changes she wants to see in the world. So I don't think the school, I agree, it's their schools. They fund them. They control them. It's, in many ways, it's their schools but it's one of the last spaces where we have a, 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 where we gather in huge numbers and have the power and strength in numbers collectively to try to affect what goes on. And I think the struggle over schools remains really important, not only to improving the quality of our lives right now, but to building up this, the kind of strength that we need to have a different. There were two questions before that about student involvement and about high state standardized testing, but also, I mean, like, more specifically, the regents, right? If you all know, in, in New York State, it's one of the only, I don't know if there are any states that do this, but, like, I grew up, I was born and raised in California. There are no regents you have to take to graduate high school. New York is, like, the only place. It's pretty, uh, you know what that's about. It's, like, systemically racist. Um, and what, who determines what are on those tests, how get everything, that you learn in school is geared towards passing a standardized test. My son is in a school like this, and I tell him, I'll be honest, do your best. I really care what you're getting out of your classes. If there's something you can get out of it, I don't really care <laughs> um, about passing a region. And that's the God honest truth. Um, student involvement. There are about 30 or so uh, what we call consortium high schools in New York City and a few outside of the city. And they were part of the first kind of opt-out of standardized testing when the regents were first being um, enforced by the Board of Regents way up in Albany, right? Um, and basically, I see Adam here is a teacher at Harvest Collegiate. I don't know if you don't mind if I call you out. Amazing, amazing um, consortium school where the teachers get to design their courses. And a lot of this is what we call an emergent curriculum. Like in the last time we taught this curriculum, we do in a British class the, the J4A, the Justice for All Question Mark course. A question, the question, can one person make a difference, really stuck with kids. Because in the beginning of the year when we ask them, they're like, the president decides. Right? The president is the one who um, can make a difference. The people, the government, the government, the government is the one who is, gives us our rights. And by the end of the year, they realize that these troublemakers, these change makers, in fact, we just did this activity, are getting ready to do this activity with a change makers 101 book on, out of Haymarket, where the kids are going to be looking at all these different change makers and determine, so who are these people? What were they fighting for? What strategies did they use? And what kind of like personal characteristics did they have to fight for these things? And these are, they're gonna be the ones who basically drive the instruction. So the teachers have to be able to facilitate the learning, to create the space for kids to drive what they're learning. And for us, two years ago when we did this study, it was the kids who kept driving home, can one person make a difference? And when their mind was, their minds were completely blown that they could possibly be change makers in this world, my co-teacher and I, that's what we went with. We changed, everything that we started planning was to create space for them to learn more about this. And by the end of the year, they were doing, I mean, they were talking about people that a lot of folks had never heard of, right? They created their own social action projects by the end of the year. Um, eight to 10 year olds. It is possible for students to drive what they want to learn. And there are consortium high schools and there need to be more of them where curriculum is driven by the needs and the desires of students who want to understand their conditions and how to make them better. Not enforced by some bureaucratic, private-public partnership of government 
of scripted curriculum, force-fed, right? So that's where I want to say, and all, I say like, flip the table on the board, on the regents. We don't need them, right? Let's, let's have instruction driven by our communities. So I have the person in the blue shirt next, and then um, Frankie. Hi, my name is Paul Gilman. I've been in green for I don't know how long. And, um, okay, so it's mostly greens and ISO and socialist uh, people here, which is good. And so what's the main difference between like a socialist education and a capitalist education? I mean, it's great we're talking about curriculum, and I like that. But we want to get the people involved, and we actually don't want the capitalist, even the capitalist regime, to run the education system. So how are we going to change that? Okay? And, um, well, to say one thing, I'm a product of the New York City public school system. My mother was a teacher for 25 years in the public school, IS 119 in Glendale. She had to deal with Nazis all day long. And, um, but she was okay with that, which was sad. And uh, I'm also went to the CUNY system. You know, I got two degrees, one from BMCC and one from CUNY Queens College, and I'm really grateful for that. So basically, I said, my question involves the difference between a socialist education, capitalist, and how we can extradite this education from the capitalist regime. I have uh, Frankie, and then the person, yeah. Hey, I'm Frankie. Um, I teach kindergarten. Um, so I guess I wanted to say a couple things, and then sort of had a question. Um, I think right now, obviously, there's a huge thing going on with Kavanaugh. And all, there's so much discussion around everything Trump is doing. But I also think one of the things we want to be talking about with people is that um, the way the Democrats would like to pose it is that Trump is just the root of all evil. We just get rid of him, everything will get back to normal. But the question is, what kind of normal was that and is it? Because um, all this, all the things that we deal with here in New York State, in like the bluest state, the most liberal city in the world, there's intense racism, oppression, inequality. So if you think about it, in New York State, mass incarceration, the biggest segregated city, uh, city schools in the, in the in the country, that's not because of Trump, that's because of our whole systematic, the way things are running, mass inequality, healthcare, school funding overcrowded, and this is the richest city in, in probably one of the places in the world, so there's absolutely no reason it has to be like that. Um, even if you think of cops versus guidance counselors in our schools, there are more cops and security in our schools than there are guidance counselors. Um, so I wanted to take uh, add that aspect to it of why I think this campaign is important, um, but then also, just the bigger aspect about socialism and education is that it's really about democracy. Because if you think about the way our society runs in our school system, the people who make the decisions about what children learn, what happens to teachers, what happens in schools, are billionaires who have never studied anything in education like Betsy DeVos. Or in New York State, we, or in New York City, we have mayoral control. So parents, teachers, students actually don't have any say. The mayor and whoever he chooses have to say. Um, and I think what she was... Uh, talking about is about community controls, about democratizing the whole system, about putting it back in the hands of teachers, parents, and students, that we're actually the ones who make the schools run and do all the work who know about education. We should be collectively deciding what happens under that. Um, and that's something that's actually, uh, neither political party wants that to happen, actually do the complete opposite. And I think that's something in the campaign we want to raise about, and that is raised, actually, about those issues. Um, and one thing, particularly in New York school, City Schools is happening, I think we should pay attention to, which is exciting, but also there's, it depends on which way it's spun, is the new chancellor's talking a lot about um, restorative justice and um, culturally relevant curriculum and anti-bias training among teachers, which is important because there are a lot of teachers out there who do have very backwards and racist ideas and it needs to be challenging to think about that. Right. But then the other thing is that if you leave it off the other part of the hook is it leaves off the whole structural racism and the real root of the systematic inequality and racism um, and says, oh, it's just about teachers, you just have to do a better job and be anti-racist with leaving the real, actual culprits off the hook that's the city, the state, and the billionaires who run this, this city and all the racist policies they have. Um, so think about another aspect of that that we should really pay attention to um, in this fight um, about pointing at supporting that, but then also pointing out like what's the real cause of systematic inequality in our system, and like that's what the school 
systems need to pay attention to, and that's actually who should be held accountable the most. Um, and the last thing is about social movements and students really quickly is I think one thing is students learn from the society they live in, and if anytime you see massive social struggles and political movements, it, trigger, it tri trickles down to the lower grades. Um, and I think that's happening now more and more so. So we have a common activist in the ISR, Leah Petty, whose students actually organized a mass walkout against metal detectors. And it wasn't necessarily because the teachers told them to, but they had been exposed to curriculum, but also exposed to mass walkouts against gun violence. So I think the way that we can help is our union actually getting and supporting students and teachers supporting them and being part of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, Brian talked about uh, parents who want um, education and not schooling for their children. And, and Gia talked about teachers who are standing up and going on strike and also developing curricula that changes the dynamic. But how do we co connect those things? And I don't mean individually, but collectively. How do we connect parents and teachers? And I'm glad the last uh, questioner asked about mayoral control because I think um, one of the ways that this neoliberal fascist agenda was implemented was mayoral control. So how do we get control back with students, teachers, parents, and the community? All right, so after Lucy, I'll call uh, Adam. I didn't realize it was next. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I got distracted. Um, well, I guess, uh, um, going off the last two speakers, just, um, Right, I mean, I think going back to this question of, you know, you talk about all this great potential curriculum, where does that come from? It comes from the teachers, right? And I think that the idea of teachers along with students and parents having real control over schools is really, is really key in order to think about the solution. And I, you know, I just, there's a, there's a, the old documentary that, uh, that Brian was in called, um, the inconvenient truth about waiting for Superman, which was the counter to waiting for Superman. And one, one thing he, I think it was in that movie where he talked about being a teacher, you're sitting there in your classroom and, and basically these politicians and policymakers are lobbying these policy bombs that then explode in your classroom, right? And just this lack of, like teachers just having to deal with this assault from, you know, so-called experts and, Policymakers who are claiming to be trying to fix our schools who are actually just creating an incredible mess that teachers then have to, to clean up and teachers being very much at the core of trying to, to fight that. Uh, I know in my daughter's elementary school, you know, when they redid the, um, the, um, the state exams a few years ago and, and they, they paid Princeton all this money um, to, to come, not Princeton, is it Pearson? Pearson. Pearson, all this money to write, rewrite the entire new curriculum for the test, and it wasn't ready in September when the school started. Um, and then when it, they did get it, it was, the teachers looked at it, and they were just like, it's so messed up, we have to rewrite it. And the teachers took their extra time after school to rewrite the curriculum, to reorder it in a way that they thought could be usable for them, for their, their students, you know what I mean? And so it's like, Again, it just goes back to empowering, te the, the teachers are the ones who are on the ground um, who actually can see you know, what, are, what are the best things, whether it's teaching, like what you're talking about, the history of Columbus um, in that kind of way. Um, and so I guess I just wanted to bring it back also to, okay, then I just wanted to bring it back to what is going on in terms of these strikes that happen in West Virginia where teachers are just fighting for basic necessities of being able to like, not have to work three jobs so that they can they can focus on teaching for a minute, um, as well as you know fall, schools are falling apart, books and things like that. Um, to like the, the the UTLA teachers who are talking about going on strike um, in in October, um, you know, getting back to you know where where that movement is at and what's the next step around that. Okay. All right, so we've got uh, Adam and then uh, Gloria. Um, so, as, as Gia mentioned, I teach at one of these consortium schools that, that is exempted from most of the region's exams, um, which I think helps us envision both kind of um, the uh, extent to which you can kind of reform public schools uh, under capitalism, but also some of the limits. 
um, in, in which that is possible. Um, so first, you know, I think around curriculum, um, you know, I, I think one, we should say that the, the right wing typically gets that curriculum is a place that, that needs to be tackled, right? So the Koch brothers, I'm a social studies teacher, the Koch brothers fund this huge Bill of Rights Institute curriculum that is kind of you know, pushed into schools. Whereas I think actually the left outside of ed the education teacher world typically has not seen curriculum as, as a, a, a place of struggle, which I think is a problem. Um, it's interesting now that um, you have Trump in, I think what a lot of the liberal response is, at, at least in New York City, what I've seen from like Richard Carranza and like on the top, uh, top da down has been this response of like, what can we do curricular wise actually? Um, and Brian and I wrote a piece um, about the you know, $23 million that they're putting towards anti-bias education and tried to uh, push it in a more radical direction saying, we, we need to actually use this to develop a curriculum that talks about structural um, racism. Um, and actually, it was widely you know, received by you know, the teaching and learning department actually called me up and is coming into my classroom um, because of that piece and wants to know, like, how do you do this, right? And of course, my response, how do you do this? Well, we can do this because we don't have to teach the standardized tests, right? Um, and unfortunately, most of the schools in the DOE do, right? They have, they have to teach to these tests, and therefore they don't have the freedom to do these culturally relevant curriculum um, because they, 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 those, are not, those things are not the standards, right? The black history is not the standards, right? Chicano, Latin, Latin, Latinx history is not in the standards and so forth. So, so we have to, I think, th there's an opening there to push them on this, first of all. And then second of all, I want to say, you know, in terms of the limits, um, you know, a very interesting meeting I went to today at school. I went to a rare school, at, you know, we had a rare school where our principal actually presents some of the budget to us and, and gets our input. We don't have decision-making power, but she gets our input, right? Um, which is rare. Um, and what she said is, actually a lot of schools right now are running in a big deficit um, because we had raises in our contract. And for some reason, when there are raises, right, um, <laughs> They're, that's not actually factored into budgets. Um, it's insane, right? So that's not actually factored into budgets. And so schools just go into deficit at a time, by the way, that the city has an enormous surplus, um, that there's schools all around the city that are going further into a deficit right now. Um, so I actually think, given the context, right, you know, I, I, I think there's been some teacher strikes around the country, right, um, that that actually provides a big opening um, for us to, as socialists, to kind of push through oh. what should be done. Um, so I have uh, Gloria and then uh, Hannah. Thanks, really great comments. Uh, so I was one of those kids in, it was junior high school that there was no middle school, in my school. Uh, and, and high school that we're in detention and suspended often for social justice reasons. That was the Vietnam I War, right? and, and no news. And so, but just people brought up the social movements and, and the kind of activism in addition to kind of classroom involvement that Gia talked about. And so, you know, I guess the biggest one we've seen was against gun violence. But, you know, I'd like to see, you know, how else are we activating? We can activate students in that way and connecting it to the teacher strike. Because you know strikes can go either way. You know, remember the transit strike? There was a point that people were really supportive of the transit workers. What's happening in those uh, cities where there are uh, teacher strikes? Are the parents and kids supporting it? Because it's easy to cause those divisions, just like they cause the race divisions, uh, the class divisions. It's the same thing, right? When we are when teachers and parents and those kids most of the time are from the same class, working class. Uh, so those are, those are connections I'm interested in. And then just kind of listening to Adam. It's not just schools like Adam, right? So my son went to one of those public schools that are you know, kind of high level, and so they got to be exempt from things. So it kind of, the division, um, uh, you know, kind of begats the division, right? You're in an affluent neighborhood, therefore you're an affluent school, and therefore you are exempt because your teachers have more latitude to be creative and come up with these ideas, but the schools that are really suffering Right, they're clamping down on those kids in neighborhoods in, in our same district. I mean, that's, you know, my, my, my latest challenge was when I was on the PTA and the SLT, I asked for kind of a socialist type of 
PTA experience in our district, which was, can we share our resources? Can we do something in the schools in our district? Because we couldn't even spend the money. There was so much money one year that came in. Of course, as the deficit started, the budget problem, that changed. But the school didn't lose very much because of the zip code. Hey, I'm Hana. I also graduated from New York City Public Schools, and actually, my elementary school was it was my community dome school, but it was a progressive school. And then I went on to one of those high states, nasty high schools, and CUNY, SUNY, and now um, then I became a socialist. Then I became an occupational therapist in the schools, and now I'm officially a New York City school parent, kindergarten of a kindergarten this year, and. A lot of it has been said from the school side. I wanted to add one thing about my experience of the whole application for kindergarten process that I think is something that um, for people who talk to parents or are parents should be, you know, something that we have to raise. The kindergarten application process, man, that was like a time consuming several months of my life, you know, going to forums and this and that and trying to figure it out. Meanwhile, my school district is so overcrowded and actually my zone school is proportionally the most overcrowded, it's at 150% capacity, which means that they don't get to go anywhere. They don't, basically, they don't leave their classroom. They get 20 minutes for lunch, and then they're um, herded into the auditorium to watch 20 minutes of a DVD. That's recess. <laughs> um, things like that. That the school, it's actually a newer building. It's a nice building. It has a nice science lab, this and that, but it's all used as basic classrooms. Um, so that's like, that's, so a lot of my, parent friends who when we're um, going through this process together, it's so hard to figure out, like most of my friends wanted to stay in their you know, community schools, but then they're thinking, oh my God, how's my kid gonna do without recess? How are they gonna do in a class of 25 kindergartners with one teacher? And so then you start thinking, okay, what about this and that and the other? And, um, and what was I gonna say about that? Um, and it takes a lot of savvy to know how to navigate, but you can navigate. You can find loopholes. And so that also creates a disparity, right? Because then the progressive schools get, you know, it's the middle, more middle class, often, um, more often white parents that can figure out how to get their kids accepted into such and such program. And in, in fact, I pulled a few strings to get my son into his dual language class that he was initially accepted to, and we found out he wasn't. And then I emailed the, uh, what's it called, superintendent, because I knew to do that. But other parents, actually, my um, goddaughter's little brother, was kicked out of his dual language class for a kind of similar reason. His mom, who's a monolingual Spanish speaker, did not know she could email the superintendent and get her son back into that program, you know? So I think all these disparities, and but it all comes back to, and this is what I was always talking to my friends about, it all comes back to this fake scarcity. It's like, if you actually funded community schools the way they're supposed to be funded, the way the state court system demanded that they be funded, you know, like, this is all money that should be there, and it would take away so much stress off parents' lives, it would create the opportunities for all the education um, that we're talking about as opposed to the schooling. Because so much of the schooling ends up being because if one adult with 25 and five-year-olds, who like half the time they're just trying to figure out if they have to go to the bathroom so they don't have an accident or whatever. Um, so I think that's one thing, and I didn't get to speak about special ed, but I think that's another thing. And um, just the class size issue, power, like there's so many issues with special ed, and it's again a thing where some parents can advocate and they can get their kids all sorts of services, some of which are frankly unnecessary, but it's all in this, this very artificially created environment of scarcity, of lack, of you know, like having to dog eat dog. And I think that's something that as socialists we can really um, attack and try to broaden the picture and broaden the rise and say expectations. Okay, uh, my name's uh, Mike Gans, and I have a couple quick questions, I'll keep it brief. Um, I think it's uh, important that we focus on like the progress of, the, of our movement, our ideas, and our beliefs, but we also need to be aware of, like, be defensive and protective of what's coming at us from the opposite direction. And so we're talking about uh, social, socialist solutions for education here, um, but what they're pushing on the other side is essentially fascist solutions for education. We're having more police in schools, and even as much as uh, in the Democratic primary debate between Cuomo and Nixon, uh, Cuomo said that he was against teachers having the right to strike, which is 
fascism in education, like straight up. So it's, uh, what do we do to not only progress our ideas, but also combat the polar opposite that's coming at us in full force from the other side? Uh, and then, I think it's Mr. Syracuse, is that him? He mentioned earlier about how we're preaching to the choir here, that there's only a handful of people here that aren't already like on board with this, with our ideas. Uh, and I recently heard an uh, interview that Howie Hawkins did on uh, a Democratic Socialist of America podcast, Pod Damn America, just came out last week. And he was talking with a group who aren't Green Party, but they all identify as Democratic Socialists of America and trying to reach out for them for their support and endorsement because the ideas are very, very similar. So it's how do we, um, how do we move forward and bridge that gap, particularly between the growing uh, DSA movement and the eco-socialist movement of the Green Party, which I think are very much aligned and we should be pushing ideas together. Alright, so I have uh, Nikki and then the person in the back in the white shawl. And I think that'll be our last speaker before we send it back to Gia and Brian. Well, hi. Um, I'm going to be quick because Hannah already mentioned it, but I also had a question about um, special education and like English language learners, like sort of students that are going to need more resources. Um, I'm looking into going into either special education or um, ESL teaching. And um, wish me luck. Hopefully, I should start next year. But um, Anyways, yeah, I guess I was wondering, like, sort of, like, how you see, like, you know, all these, like, radical curriculums and stuff, which are so awesome, but also, like, how does that, how, how do we address the needs of disabled students and, like, students who are learning English? Um, I, I read a statistic somewhere that's, like, almost 50% of students in NYC public schools are um, English language learners. So, I guess, like, obviously, like, those issues, especially with special education, like, also has to do with, um, things outside of the school, like, you know, obviously we advocate for single payer, which would be something that could obviously include the quality of life for disabled people. Um, but yeah, I guess just like how that looks in terms of special education um, and ESL, um, because obviously you want like students to learn together and stuff, but, and considering like those are the types of students that are often, um, you know, forgotten about or aren't given the resources they need. So like, what does like radical curriculum with those students look like? Hi, my name is Danny, and I'm a Green Party person, and um, I have also a child in public school who is now in eighth grade, but he started in third grade at one of the most progressive public schools in the city, which is Oakland New School, uh, where the kids are now doing, uh, you know, pee bats, and my son now goes to BCS, which is Brooklyn Collaborative, which is the sister school to Brooklyn New School, um, and they, they do radical stuff. Like, they, you know, they, they approach it. We had the highest opt-out rate. Um, in the, I think in the entire state, both schools, um, and of course they're attacking us and trying to um, stop the opt-out movement. I think in terms of like movements within the schools, opt-out is really, you know, an explosion of, of, of the kind of radicalism among parents, but of course it's being squelched and squashed, and you know, they're trying to, to, to get rid of it. Um, but, um, and, and PBATs, by the way, are where kids present their work to panels instead of being graded, they um, sorry they they present their work and it's an incredible process and that's something and when we say all the things we don't want one of the things we do want is is these P, this PBAT system but what I also want to say is that you know all of these things are like band aids on a broken arm right the, the system is the problem the system is the problem and and it's like it's very frustrating to be a green right now because the greens. You know, we did really well in the last election for governor here, and now we are being, there's a huge green out, um, and we're, we're in danger of losing our ballot status because there's so much, you know, Cuomo saw that we beat the Working Families Party in 2014, and he said, hmm, how am I going to squelch this and take and co-opt these ideas? So, you know, they gave, he gave $50 minimum wage, and he did, uh, you know, parents leave, and he did ban, ban fracking, which the Greens were, you know, you know how he uh, debated him on TV. And, and so there's a huge problem now where somehow people think that the Greens are some oats, you know, when Occupy Wall Street, they thought the Greens were, oh, it's electoral politics, it's not. The people need to recognize that the Green Party is an anti-system party, that we are actually trying to break through on, you know, on all that, 
all that level, that we want to change the system and that we do every single thing that we do is to change the system. And I'm pleading with people to get involved because it's, it's kind of the answer <laughs> to all the things that are the problem if people could see that and get on board and realize that we have a party that, that we can move mountains with if people could realize that we are here and, and we need help because <laughs> they're trying to stop us. Yeah, I, and I'll start where, um, thank you for everybody for coming out and for such an interesting um, discussion. And I'm going to start where Danny left off because I too am excited by the growth of uh, the socialist movement, particularly DSA. Of course, I think that the growth of DSA is a really important fact in our modern life and is a good, good thing. And I'm thrilled by it. Even though I'm not a member of DSA, I stand in solidarity with them and I consider them comrades. And I say in that spirit of comradeship that I'm disappointed that they have not endorsed this independent challenge to Cuomo. Mm -hmm. um, and that there seems to be a, um, you know, DSA is a, I can't speak for them, of course, they're a heterogeneous organization, many different trends, um, but there seems to be a debate inside DSA about uh, what to do with the Democratic Party, and frankly, it seems to me, and again, I'm not an expert, I can't speak for them, but it seems to me that people who favor running for office inside the Democratic Party at present are winning. And that therefore, that has made things very difficult for trying to preserve the idea of independent politics and the importance of in political independence from a party that is wholly owned and controlled by the millionaires and the billionaires. That is the Democratic Party. And for us to have our own thing is incredibly, incredibly difficult. That said, and of course we should always be dissatisfied with, even if we had five times as many people in the room, we're still in New York City, I mean, it's still gonna be a tiny meeting. Even if, you know, even if most people, we should always be dissatisfied with who's in the room and how big and broad it is. There's no doubt about that. However, given the tough spot that we're in and the difficulties that our movement has faced, um, I would never underestimate the value of gathering ourselves together and talking amongst each other. I mean, people in this room, it seems to me, ask real questions that they are struggling with and trying to figure out. What are we gonna do about special education? How are we gonna reach out to parents? What are we gonna do about the fact of the kind of dog-eat-dog -dog nature of kindergarten admissions and all of these things that are part of the landscape that's very challenging? The Frankie race, what are we gonna do about the fact that people, that Trump is so obnoxious and awful that people think just getting him out of office is the priority? And by the way, those of us who are standing on principle independent of the Democratic Party, be prepared to have feces smeared all over you and your face in this coming election because the shitstorm is, excuse me, is going to be nasty. And I'm already seeing it gather, the, the, the storm clouds are gathering on social media that we are to blame for 2016, that we are the problem at the end of the day. Um, when the candidates suck, blame the voters, uh, I suppose is their strategy. Um, let me just say a couple last points. I agree with those who raised the issue of, um, there's a real contradiction of the fact that the, the current chancellor is raising all this progressive and even in some cases radical stuff about the need to challenge racism in the schools, um, standing up to uh, elite parents, uh, so, you know, speaking strongly about segregation and curriculum and teacher attitudes, all of that is actually welcome. Um, what's weird about it from our perspective is a lot of this is like stuff we've been calling for and now the employer is calling for it. And like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It means that it's, however it's carried out, it's going to be carried out by the employer handing it down to the employees. When the employer says to you, now listen here, you gotta stop being so racist. It's like there's something weird about that. There's something weird about that. So we just can't get rid of that fact. And so what, I think what we have to do is recognize that there's a danger that they will, just like the corporate head reform, took anti-racism and wrapped themselves in the robe and hijacked it for their own weird, twisted agenda, so too it is possible for liberal, well-meaning reformists in charge of our school system to take well-meaning anti-racist initiatives and distort them because of a failure to be willing to point the finger at themselves and do what needs to be done to redistribute resources in this city. If you don't make classrooms and schools the kinds of places where you can do culturally relevant curriculum, if you have 25, 26, 
30 kids in your classroom, you cannot tell a teacher to uh, examine their bias and be culturally relevant. That is just scapegoating. That is not genuine teaching and learning. And we have to say that they have to couple all of these anti-racist initiatives have to be coupled with a redistrib redistribution of resources. That's what will make them meaningful. That's what will make them meaningful. Make the teacher's life better. Make the student's life better. Make the families and the parents' life better and easier, and then you will be uh, making some inroad um, in, in, in those regards. And I want to just end with a story, which is that I also, following in Gia's footsteps, I tried to be like Gia, and I like, I was like, okay, so now I'm a public school parent, I'm gonna do like Gia did, and I'm gonna go like organize the parents at my daughter's school to opt out, and you know, whatever. So I like set out a little table, I got a parent to do it with me, we had our literature out, you know, we're giving out the leaflets, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not gonna say it like felt like a lead balloon because you know, it's like it's a progressive school, some people are interested, but it just was not the warm welcome that I was expecting. And instead what I got from a lot of parents was like anxiety. They're so anxious. And this is like elementary school. What are they so anxious about? Hannah, uh, when she spoke, made me think of this. It's like they're just anxious. They're like, well, what, what's going to happen to my kid when they try to go to middle school? What's going to happen to my kid when they try to go to high school? It's like you don't feel like your kid is just going to be OK. Like, it's going to be OK. They're going to end up in a great school because all the schools are great. And it kind of doesn't matter where they go because all the schools are great. No, the schools are very different from each other. So they really refuse to redistribute resources to raise the quality of all of the schools to take the pressure off of the competition between the schools. That means that we confront, as parent, individual parents, a situation we did not create, where it really matters a lot where your kid goes. And the disparities between quality of teaching and resources and whatever are dramatic, and therefore you have to be a shopper. And therefore you have to shop and like navigate, and you have to do all of that work, and that undermines solidarity. And I think we almost have, and this is even for even putting aside charter schools, and even though I agree with you, but putting it aside, it's almost like we have privatization without privatization. We have privatization within the public schools because they have introduced so much competition between them that we are all living as competitors, having a very difficult time extricating ourselves from it. So somehow the movement for solidarity between parents, teachers, community, I mean, to me, the soil of that, the, the soil springs eternal, the possibilities spring eternal because we all hate it. And we don't like what they're imposing on the schools. We don't like what they're doing it. So it creates the opportunity for us to see common overlapping interests and to band together and try to do something about it. But it's very difficult because the, the basis of it right now is highly, highly individualistic and competitive. And, and, and that's just what you have to deal with just to try to get by. So we have a lot that we're up against. And anytime I'm able to gather with people, uh, however many or few of you, and talk about these things and try to get our heads around them, I welcome the opportunity. Thank you for coming out here. And I know that each of you, if you take it upon yourself to be an organizer, your impact for thinking these things through and trying to get them straight for yourself, the impact of what you do where you live and where you teach and where you work and where you go to school will be that much more magnified. Thank you. Everything Brian, oh, this is awesome. Oh, here. No, I got it. <laughs> Everything Brian just said. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I just want to add, okay, so recently a uh, New York City-based Korean, so my family's from Korea, I was born here, but um, that was where, you know, they get really like, oh, Korean-American is running for office. So they wanted to interview me. I went all the way to Flushing um, to do this interview. And the first question, and like the question that they want to know is like my position on the specialized high school exams, right? And they expected me to be like, yes, children should have more opportunities to take these tests. This is the answer they wanted me to say. It feeds right into this system of competition that we are being forced to kind of funnel ourselves through. And I came out with a totally different answer. And I said, the real question we need to be asking is, why, if these programs are so highly coveted, again, going back to that scarcity rhetoric, if these programs are so highly coveted and there are so many people who want to do more for um, sciences, arts, and all kinds of scarce programs, why don't we have these in every single community? Why is it that there are only like, a few schools that all of our kids are fighting over seats for, why? 
that's the real question. And he just looked at me completely like dumbstruck. He's like, it could, it, it, the idea, yeah, the, the idea was just so profoundly like out of his realm. He was like, but, but our readers are not going to understand that. I said, yes, they can. I said, put that question in the article. I probably can't read it because I don't read or write Korean. I'm really ashamed of it. But please put that, but that, that's what I said. The question is not how can we get our kids to be better, you know, like have a better edge in a, com in a competitive system. It's why don't we have all of these uh, programs available for the students who need them and want them, right? And that's basically what we're talking about. And if you want to talk about a systemic level, we have the Campaign for Fiscal Equity, which is fighting for something like $4.5 billion owed New York State's public education system. Come on, Cuomo, pay up. The, the courts already ruled in favor of New York, New York's public school systems, and they have not paid. Okay, and then in New York City, why do we have such a lean production model? Fair student funding. Fair student funding is a system that was put into place when Bloomberg was mayor, and he appointed Joel Klein, right? A, a media, a, you know multi-millionaire person who is like an expert in lean production models. So there used to be a time when schools, and I'll, I'm gonna get a little technical, schools used to get a separate funding allocation based on your average teacher salary. Why? We have a contract, just like Adam was talking about. And so your, your salaries came based on the average teacher salary. That was separate. And then schools got a separate allocation that paid for like operational costs. Under fair student funding, it's anything but fair. Each student comes with a certain amount, okay? And if you have a student with an IEP or special education, they get 1.5, okay? So let's say a student, each student gets $8,000. Then a student with an IEP or an ENL student, English with, uh, who's learning a new language, gets, you know, 1.5 with like, what, $12,000, okay? You're supposed to cover your staffing. Now, if you have teachers and you value, right, the two factors that impact student learning the most, teacher educational experience, okay, and class size. Those are in-school factors. Okay, outside of school factors, that's a whole other ball. But in-school factors. So now you've created a lean production model within the school where administrators are now disincentivized to keeping veteran teachers. And so what happens? They get attacked. They're being they're the ones who are being uh, targeted, right, for pull, for pushing, getting pushed out. These are the same teachers. I know so many of them didn't make it to, to their retirement. Why? Because they were being pushed out and targeted by abusive administrators. I see a lot of heads nodding because people know this is happening in their schools. That's how I actually became a chapter leader is because all of a sudden veteran teachers were being attacked. And I can't tell you how many times I go to the retirement offices to try and get them early retirement. And it would rip my heart out because not only were they facing this, they were having to go to doctors for the mental anxiety and stress yeah. after spending 25 plus years of their life dedicated to educating New York City public school students, right? And particularly the disappearance of black and brown educators. So now we have Students who are not seeing teachers who look like them. We're getting teachers recruited from out of state, Midwest, other places that don't look anything like them, let alone teaching culturally relevant pedagogy or having any kind of anti-bias training. Okay? Yeah, I'm gonna tell it because we're experiencing it every day. It's profound. But somebody said it, and I can't remember who it was, that yeah, the blame is like the focus is all on us and the schools. And never, it's like distracting away, I think it was Frankie who said it, right? Distracting away from the systemic racism. I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. It's not that we're segregated because of poverty. It's because of the disparity that's been created by corporations who own our government officials and own the system. And unless we change that, then we can't talk about anything else. And what we teach our students about this, what we teach the next generations about this, right, is going to have an effect 
on whether or not we're going to be able to sustain life on this planet. Let's break it down and be real. So it's unless we undo the racism, the sexism, the patriarchy through our collectivism. So the antithesis to competition, the, anti the antithesis to individualism is a sense of collectivism. We have to say, if my brother or sister doesn't have or can't get to that school, I'm not gonna have it either. So that until then, until then, we cannot fight for the kind of world we want. So I know that people are asking, how do you build connections with community? How do you do that? You have to create the spaces. Maybe it's through your PTA at first, but then outside of that, you have to be able to build the spaces where we're working together. When we organized Opt Out, we started with two or three. We can't just be activists in the room showing up at rallies. We have to learn how to be organizers. So I spent um, this past Saturday and the weekend before training uh, trainers to train organizers through the Labor Notes Secrets of a Successful Organizer Training. Um, a lot of the DSA people are there. I'm a member of DSA, right? It's, a, it's ironic. Um, but we need to train organizers. But I'm there like in that space saying, what is our, what, you know, I don't, I don't want to come in there acting like I'm a know-it-all. We have to build our knowledge together. And part of building our common understanding is knowing the difference between being an activist and knowing how to be an organizer. And I think the knowledge is in the space. The knowledge is in the room. You have your expertise. Whether it be education, whether it be in healthcare, whether it be in prison reform, and, you know, whatever it is, housing. Oh my God, how many of our families are facing housing, facing housing crisis? I, in the middle of this campaign, I had to move. So I found another single parent, and the four of us are living, <laughs> we're gonna be roommates. We each have our kid, and we're, we have to show the rent. Like, Lean production, right? Um, scarcity, all of that. So we're all just trying to survive. But there are mechanisms in place. Worker-owned cooperatives. Those kinds of ideas and principles can exist in the public school system. And we have to find a way to do that. Um, yeah, you guys, homelessness is worse now than during the Great Depression. I don't know if you know that. And the number one leading cause in out of the interviews is uh, basically people forced out of their homes because they couldn't pay their rent. That's the number one leading cause of homelessness. And our kids, our kids are at the highest homeless rate, homelessness rate more than ever. So when we're talking about cortisol levels and stress, I think back and I mention this all the time, the Maasai tribe in Africa, they don't greet each other, they're nomadic. They go around and they say, um, they don't say, hello, how are you? They, their greeting is literal translation and how are the children? How are the children? I'm a special education teacher. The curriculum I teach, they get. They learn it. We learn about disability rights. We learn about um, LGBTQ rights. We learn about um, the, you know, the farm workers. And we learn about all of that throughout the course of the year. And we understand how the origins of the US leads to why we still have these problems right now. The system of empire is at, is at fault, right? So we have to, it's not just individuals, because we can replace individuals. We can blame that person that in power. We can blame that person in power until we undo the system. We're going to be stuck here. So with that, I'm going to just end there, and hopefully we can talk more beyond today and create answers. Thank you, guys.